The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. In verse 1 of Revelation 11, John is given a reed like a scepter and told to measure the naos or inner temple, and not to measure the outer court. Now the naos is where it is all happening and what it's all about at this time. The naos is God working in the church of Jesus Christ. Now John is told to leave out the outer court because it is given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Then John is told that God will give power to his two witnesses who would prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now the two periods of time are identical quantities. 42 lunar months is 1,203 score days. The two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. The characteristic of the power of the two witnesses is analogous to Elijah and Moses who appeared with Christ in the Transfiguration. Elijah and Moses are types of the church and state and witnesses to Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, the two witnesses complete their testimony and are slain by the beast from the bottomless pit. Their dead bodies lie for three and a half days in the streets of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Namely, it is Jerusalem. Now, Schofield cross-references this beast to Revelation 13 and 1, and so it is a composite beast of those kingdoms represented by the visions of Daniel, namely Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, in Revelation 13 and 5, we read this beast was given power to continue 42 months. And after three and a half days, the witnesses were raised and caught up to heaven. Now, if we compare this with the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, we note that the Messiah was to confirm the covenant with many for one week and to be cut off in the middle of the week making sacrifice and oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations to make it desolate until the consummation and that which was determined was poured upon the desolate. Now I know that modern popular futurist theology disagrees with what I have said, but what I have just said is what the church believed for almost 2,000 years until the prophetic speculation of Edward Irving and J.N. Darby. Now, my personal interpretation of this passage is that Jesus ministered for three and a half natural years of lunar months or one, two, six, oh days before he was crucified. The covenant was still in effect for another three and a half years until the call of Cornelius and the gospel to the Gentiles. During the second period of three and a half years, Jerusalem was trodden down by the Gentiles who received it by this statement, quote, we have no king but Caesar. Well, what about the three and a half days that the bodies of the two witnesses lie in the streets of Jerusalem? What about the statement of Jesus in Matthew 12, 40, that he would be three days and nights in the heart of the earth? Now, if Jesus was crucified and buried on Good Friday and resurrected on Sunday, how do you get around the scripture about three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? The Jewish mindset might allow you to count Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as three days, but not three days and three nights. Now, the difficulty has arisen from the fact that students have missed the key points of John 19. The fact that the Jewish day is from sunset to sunset and not midnight to midnight. And the fact that the first day of the Feast of Passover was a high day or a Sabbath. And so we have read John 19.31 as referring to the weekly Sabbath and not a high Sabbath. In John 19 and 14 we read, And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour, and he, Pilate, said, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, and they delivered him to be crucified. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on a, the cross on a Sabbath day, for that day, that Sabbath was a high day. 
besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already de dead. The ninth hour when Jesus expired was 3 p.m. on Wednesday, not Friday as we generally are taught. Jesus was buried before sunset and was in the tomb before sunset on Wednesday. Jesus was in the tomb our Wednesday night, our Thursday, our Thursday night, our Friday, our Friday night, our Saturday, and was already resurrected when Jesus came, when Mary came at the end of the weekly Sabbath at sunset on Saturday as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week or dawn on Sunday three days and three nights, in fact sunset on Saturday to dawn on Sunday is a half day to make up three and a half days. And thus, Revelation answers to Zechariah as Christ answers to Joshua. Jesus was the Messiah of Aaron and the Messiah of David. He was king, priest. Jesus was the two witnesses. Jesus was the two olive trees. Jesus was the two candlesticks. Now I want to consider the eighth vision of Zechariah, which is the vision of the flying roll or scroll. And this vision is recorded in the fifth chapter of Zechariah in verses one through four, quote, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. And he, that's the angel, said to me, What do you see? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that steals shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And everyone that swears shall be cut off as on that side according to it. And I will bring it forth, says the Lord of hosts, and shall enter into the house of the thief into the house of him that swears falsely by my name, shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Now before I elaborate this vision, I want to read my comments on this vision from a book that I have written. And I said, in this vision, Zechariah sees a flying roll. It is defined to be a curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Everyone that steals will be cut off on this side according to it, and everyone that swears will be cut off on that side according to it. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, Simply call us at segment, I said that before I comment on the vision of the flying roll, I want to read my comments on this vision from a book I've written. 
In this vision, Zachariah sees a flying roll. It is defined to be a curse that goes over the face of the whole earth. Everyone that steals will be cut off on this side according to it, and everyone that swears will be cut off on that side according to it. The Lord of hosts will bring it forth and will enter into the house of the thief and the house of him that swears falsely. By the name of the Lord, it will remain in the house and consume it. Now, Zechariah's vision for a new world order is expanding. Jews discovered as a result of the captivity and scatterings that their religion would survive the city of Jerusalem and the temple if need be. Preferably, this would not be the case in the future, but they could survive both losses if they must. Zechariah is seeing that the law of God is not tied down to the land of promise. Temple worship may be localized, but the law of God is universal. Thus, this role is not earthbound or bound to any specific land. It has the ability to go over the face of the earth and enter in the house of the good and the bad alike. Well, Schofield's comment on this is simple and adequate. Schofield says, A role in scriptural symbolism means the written word, whether of God or man. Zechariah's eighth vision is the rebuke of sin, wherever it may be, by the word of God. The two sins specifically mentioned transgress both the manward and the godward aspects of the law. To steal is to set aside our neighbor's right, and to swear is to set aside God's claim to reverence. And as always, the law can only curse. Now, the eighth vision of Torah is classic in its simplicity. Zechariah reduces it to simplicity in his vision, even as Jesus would reduce the law 500 years later to simplicity. And it's very hard to read this passage and not think of the portion of the liturgy of the word in the mainline church Eucharist called the summary of the law. And they summarize the Lord this way. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. This is the first and the great commandment. Now, Jesus said that. The second is like to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now, in my opinion, this rather simple-sounding vision of one is, is one of Zechariah's most profound and far-reaching visions and one of the most important propositions in the entire Bible. It should also cause us to do some historical retrenching, which will also help us to have a better background for what I call Second Zechariah or Hellenic Zechariah or the second portion of the book of Zechariah. Now, some scholars have put forward the idea that the world th rethinks itself and changes every 500 years or so. So it is interesting that modern management theory claims that men define their objectives and plan the critical path. But according to a renowned professor I know, what society and mankind actually does is to muddle around and muddle around and muddle around like our government until something falls out and then they regroup and start to move on. According to Usher's chronology, the flood occurred about 2400 BC. 500 years later came the call of Abraham, 1900 BC. 500 years after Abraham was the exodus from Egypt, 1400 BC. Four to 500 years later after that came the kingdom of David and Solomon, 1000 BC. 500 years later, Judah was coming out of the Babylonian captivity, 500 BC. 500 years later was the time of Jesus Christ and the watershed of history. 500 years later, Imperial Rome was collapsing and the Dark Ages starting and the ground being laid for the Holy Roman Empire. 500 years later, Rome split east and west. 500 years later was the Renaissance and the Reformation. And 500 years later is where we are now standing in a rapidly changing world. So the 500-year change proposition certainly bears serious consideration. Now, in the period from 700 B.C. to 500 B.C., the world background to the Bible was rapidly shifting. First, Assyria, who had taken northern Israel captive, was falling as Babylon was rising. Babylon then took Judah captive about 600 B.C. 
Babylon fell during the later days of Daniel the prophet, who was reading the writing on the wall in the palace as the Persian troops of Cyrus the Great were coming into the city through a water channel. The Persians let Judah go back to their homeland about 500 BC at a time when things were beginning to come together in Greece and the old Western world was beginning to change. Now, one of the things that helped Greece come together was the onslaught of Persia, and that onslaught had been solicited by some displaced Greek tyrants. Now, before we consider Persian Greece relative to Jewry, we should look at one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible. And this prophecy has confounded historians, theologians, and atheists alike. Its historical authenticity is beyond dispute. And the subject prophecy is found in the 44th and 45th chapters of Isaiah, which was written about 700 BC or 150 years before of the time of the man God is speaking to through his prophet. Isaiah 44, 21 through 28, and Isaiah 45, 1 through 13 say, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you shall not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions, and as a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, and he that formed you from the womb. I am the Lord that makes all things, that stretches forth the heavens alone, that spreads abroad the earth by myself, that frustrates the tokens of the liar and makes the diviners mad, that turn wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolish. This is a great prophecy and it is addressed to a man who won't be born for another 150 years. 55 years, a long time. That's how long world missionary evangelism has been taking care of children. It started with just a few little orphans in India and has grown to touch thousands over the last five decades. But what does child sponsorship mean? Well, child sponsorship means that someone just like you is providing food, clothing, medical care, an education, and in many cases, a home in which to live for children who have no one to turn to. Imagine for a second growing up on the streets. Imagine for a second being all alone at the age of four or five. Imagine what it's like just to survive. Those we don't help often die. Some are sold into slavery, a problem that still exists in the world today. Yet through child sponsorship, there's a bridge built, a bridge from nightmares to dreams, an opportunity for those dreams to be realized through education, an opportunity for that child who had no future now to be blessed with a future that lifts others up as you lifted him up. Child sponsorship is a very important part of World Missionary Evangelism's work. It's such an important part that it's really the heart of our mission, reaching out, saving lives. There are so many children right now who need to be sponsored. And if you were to step forward and just take one of them under your care, you would have the opportunity to get to know this child. And you would have the knowledge in your heart and in your soul that this child felt Christ's love through your donations and gifts. Why don't you pray about and think about sponsoring a child today? prophecy to Cyrus, God describes himself as he that confirms the word of his servant, performs the counsel of his messengers, says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited under the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up the decaying places thereof. I say to the deep, be dry, and I dry up your rivers. That says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, 
your foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, a Gentile, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings. Open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before you. Make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I'll give you the hidden treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I am the Lord which called you by your name. I am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my, mine elect, I have surnamed you, Cyrus, though you have not known me. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there is none else. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him that strives with his makers. Let the pots herd strive with the pots herds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, what are you making? Or your work, he has no hands. Woe to him that says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, ask of me things to come concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hands command me. I have made the earth and created, the, uh, created man on it. Even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts I have commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He's talking about Cyrus. He shall build my city, let my captives go, not for price, nor for reward, says the Lord of hosts. Well, let's talk about Cyrus. Cyrus the Great lived from 576 to 530 BC and was the, founded, the founder of the Archimedes Empire, which embraced all the civilized states of the ancient Near East. He expanded vastly and eventually conquered most of Southwest Asia and much of Central Asia and the Caucasus. And his empire stretched from the Mediterranean Sea and the Hellespont in the west to the Indus River, India in the east. It was the largest empire the world had seen thus far. Now, we will consider further a matter that Cyrus pronounced what some consider one of the first historically important declarations of human rights via the Cyrus Cylinder between 539 and 530 BC. Now the reign of Cyrus lasted about 30 years. Cyrus built his empire by first conquering the Median Empire, then the Lydian Empire, and finally the Neo-Babylonian Empire. He was succeeded by his son Cambyses, who had added Egypt, Cyrenaica, and Nubia during his short reign. Well, Cyrus was to be the first of four Persian kings who are mentioned several times in the Bible and who played a major role in the history of the Jews. Now, Cyrus respected the customs and religions of the lands he conquered, and it is said that in universal history, the role of the empire he founded lies in its very successful model for centralized administration, establishing a government working for the advantage and profit of its subjects. Now, what is sometimes referred to as the Edict of Restoration, described in the Bible as being made by Cyrus, left a lasting legacy on the Jewish religion. Cyrus is recognized for his achievements in human rights, politics, and military strategy, as well as his influence on both Western and Eastern civilization. Cyrus also played a major role in defining the national identity of modern Iran. And the influence of Cyrus extended as far as Athens, where many Athenians adopted aspects of the Achaemenid Persian culture as their own in a reciprocal cultural exchange. 
Now, the influence of SARS has been felt as far away as Iceland and colonial America, and many of the forefathers of the United States, such as Thomas Jefferson, sought inspiration from Cyrus through works such as the Cyropedia, of which he owned a copy. Now, at this point, we need to link up with a story of emerging democracy in Greece. Now, the story of Greece, for our purposes, starts with the Athenian statesman Solon, who lived 638 to 558 BC, and during whose time many city-states had seen the, ri the rise of opportunistic tyrant noblemen who grabbed power for sectional interests. And one such would-be tyrant had tried to seize power in Athens but was thwarted when the citizens of Athens awarded Solon autocratic powers. Solon enacted constitutional, economic, and social reforms and admitted all men to the ecclesia, or assembly of Athenian citizens, formed a court for all citizens. Solon left the country for a period of 10 years and visited foreign kingdoms, discussing his philosophy. And these trips included Egypt, Cyprus, and Sardis, the capital of Lydia, where he met King Croesus, who eventually lost his kingdom to Cyrus the Persian. Now, Croesus' defeat had a profound impact on the Greeks and provided a fixed point for their calendar. And he represented the last bastion of Greek cities against the incursion of Persian power in Anatolia. Well, Cyrus put Croesus on a funeral pyre as the flame was going up. Croesus said, oh, Solon, or oh, Solon. That made Cyrus curious. He said, put out the fire and bring him down. Let me talk to him about Solon. And so he became the advisor to Cyrus. Common illnesses, though largely taken for granted in our own world, claim millions of lives each year in developing nations. This is one of the reasons that World Missionary Evangelism builds and staffs medical clinics. Our doctors and nurses treat all ages, providing vaccines, general care, and even surgeries. We also educate about disease prevention, nutrition, and child care. From the smallest babies to senior citizens, WME's medical clinics and staff treat each patient with the same grace, compassion, and love shown by Christ during His ministry. In this mission and our others, we are therefore attempting to daily live out Matthew 25, 35 through 40, reaching out to the least of these. Thus, even in our medical work, the evangelism and world missionary evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work.